Hello and welcome to What's in the Night Sky for July 2024. I'm Hayley and this month we will be looking out for Jupiter and Mars putting on a show in Taurus, the Mare Frigoris on the Moon and the constellation of Corona Borealis, the Northern Crown. Let's begin by taking a look at the planets. Mercury and Venus are not particularly well placed for observing this month, but we should be able to get a good look at Saturn, Jupiter and Mars. If we have a look towards the east, so I'm looking towards the east on the 1st of July around 11 o'clock, and if I move time onwards, you can see that Saturn rises between 12 and 1 in the morning, and if I keep going, you can see that Mars rises at about 2 o'clock, followed by Jupiter at about 3 o'clock. So we've got a nice line here of Saturn, Mars and Jupiter. After about 3 o'clock, the sky is going to start brightening, ready for the sunrise. So you, at the beginning of the month, you don't get very long with Jupiter in particular before it starts to get washed out by the morning twilight. As the month goes on, the situation improves. So if we go through that process again, but instead do it on the 30th of July instead of the 1st. So you can see that by 11 o'clock, Saturn has already risen, followed by Mars at around 1 o'clock, followed by Jupiter at around 2 o'clock. And what that means is that we get a little bit longer with the planets towards the end of the month and we get they get higher before the sky begins to brighten. So you can observe these planets at, at any point in July, but the best time for observing is going to be towards the end of the month. If we go back to the beginning of the month and just concentrate on what Mars and Jupiter are doing. So I'm going to go to 3 a.m. at the beginning of the month. And you can see that Jupiter, you can just about see it at the beginning of the month, is in the constellation of Taurus. So you've got a really nice opportunity to see the planet Jupiter and some of the gems of Taurus, such as the Pleiades open star cluster, which I'm just pointing out with my mouse now. It will be hard at the beginning of the month because the sky is starting to get brighter. But as the month goes on, you'll get a, m a much better view of Jupiter in Taurus. And Mars, which is in Aries at the beginning of the month, joins Jupiter in Taurus around the 11th. So the separation between these two closes as the month goes on. I'm just going to show that to you. So moving through the month, you can see the moon going through there as well. You can see them getting closer to each other. And of course, the other thing that helps is that the skies are starting to get darker now that we've passed the summer solstice. So um, the later you observe in the month, the darker the sky will be. So now Mars and Jupiter are together in Taurus and Taurus is higher, Mars and Jupiter are higher and you can see um, that this will be quite a spectacular sight towards the middle and the end of the month. The other thing to note is that Mars is quite close to Uranus during the middle portion of the month and they make their closest approach to each other on the 15th and the 16th of July and Normally, we wouldn't say that Uranus is particularly well placed for observing this month because it, it's not very high. But if you can find Mars, which shouldn't be difficult because you've got this lovely, uh, familiar, bright constellation of Taurus. You, Mars itself is very distinctive because it has this orange glow and you've got very bright planet Jupiter here. Then if you can look at Mars with your binoculars, then you might be able to spot Uranus in the same field of view. And I'm just gonna to go to the 10th and take us through. So actually you can see it here just about to come into this field of view. So this is the field of view of a 10 by 50 pair of binoculars. And here we can see the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th. So that's their closest approach. They'll be really, really close to each other on the 15th and the 16th of July, and then moving away again. So you've got a, a period of around 10 days there where you have a really good chance of spotting Mars and Uranus together. Um, definitely worth having a go at if you haven't seen Uranus before. 
Let's take a look at what the moon is doing now. So we saw the moon coming through there as I was talking about what was happening with the planet. So let's just take a more detailed look at that. Uh, new moon this month is going to be on the 5th and full moon on the 21st. And if we go back to the 1st, you can see that we have a crescent moon quite close to Mars on the 1st. If we keep going quite close to Jupiter on the 3rd and then if we go to the other end of the month to the 24th we have a gibbous moon just after full quite close to Saturn on the 24th and then if we keep going it makes its way back over here again it's actually closer on the 25th to Saturn all the way back over towards Taurus again to make a close approach to the Pleiades uh, Seven Sisters star cluster on the 30th and then or the 29th, 30th and then Jupiter again on the 31st. Um, so this um, grouping will be really nice, this triangle made by Jupiter, Mars and um, Aldebaran, the, the angry eye of the bull, this red giant star that dominates Taurus. Um, so you've got this triangle here and then you've got the crescent moon and the, the Seven Sisters uh, star cluster, all um, really close together. So definitely try and look out for that if the skies are clear towards the end of the month. Let's go to our moon watch target for this month now. So I'm going to take us to the 21st when the moon is full while I point out what I would like you to look out for this month. So thinking back to last month, we talked about the Plato Dark Crater, which I've got my mouse on now, which is in this area of the Sea of Showers, the Bay of Rainbows that we've been talking about over the last few months. So I want to continue to move outwards from this area now and point out to you the Mare Frigoris or Sea of Cold which is this long sea that I am moving along with my mouse now and unlike the other lunar seas it's long and thin as opposed to a more rounded kind of a shape um, and it stretches to a length of 1,400 kilometers. When we take a closer look at the Sea of Cold. Um, there are some interesting features there and I'd like to point out two of the most prominent ones to you which you should be able to access with your small telescope. So we've got the Plato Crater over here which is a nice distinctive feature that you can use to orient yourself and then over here we've got these two craters so this one in the north and this slightly smaller one below. And this one, the top one, where my mouse is now, is called Aristoteles, and it's named after the famous philosopher Aristotle. And it's a crater with high terrace walls, and it's got some small off-centre peaks in the, inside it, if you your telescope is powerful enough to pick those up. And there is some ejector uh, material that's been thrown out of the crater that is spread across the floor of the Mare Frigoris as well. You can't see it very well on this image in Stellarium at the moment but there is a smaller around here somewhere a, a smaller crater joined on to Aristoteles um, called Mitchell and the smaller crater is older and um, you might be able to see it around the time um, that the Terminator is crossing this area and we'll have a go at that in a minute uh, and just below Aristoteles is the crater Eudoxus, and that is named for the ancient Greek astronomer Eudoxus of Nidus. You can also potentially spot, again, which isn't shown very well right now, there's an arc of craters, um, sorry, an arc of mountains that it seems to join the two craters in a sort of a semicircle. So looking out for the craters Aristoteles and Eudoxus, um, Aristoteles being the larger one at 90 kilometres wide and then Eudoxus below it at 70 kilometres wide. And as always with features such as craters, the best time to observe them is when 
the terminator line, the, the, the line between light and dark is close to them because what happens is they you then get shadows being cast and it enables you to um, see much more detail. So we'll try that now um, by taking a look at the few days following full moon. So full moon on the 21st, 22nd, keeping an eye on those two craters up here. 23rd, 24th, 25th, and suddenly you can see much more clearly some of those features that I was talking about. So now we can see the crater Mitchell, um, the small older crater that's joined onto Aristoteles um, quite clearly, and it wasn't really visible before. And the, also this little arc of mountains that appears to join the two craters. Um, and if we keep going, I think the 26th really shows quite well those um, the craters themselves and those additional features that I was telling you about, the smaller crater Mitchell and the, the little arc of mountains. So your moon watch target for this month is, first of all, to spot the Mare Fragoris or the Sea of Cold in the, the northern uh, part of the moon north of the Plato crater and the Sea of Showers. And then, if you have a small telescope, see if you can spot the craters Aristoteles and Eudoxus. Moving on to our constellation of the month this month. So, last month we had our constellation of the month uh, Boötes, which is a, a good constellation to look out for in the spring and the summer. And I want to talk this month about its neighbour, which is Corona Borealis. And that means the northern crown. Um, and if you want to find it, if you remember uh, last month we talked about using the Big Dipper or the plow as a pointer. And we, we use it quite a lot as a pointer because it's probably the most distinctive shape in the night sky. And you can follow the arc of the handle to get to... Um, bring everything a bit higher. To get to... Arcturus, the bright red giant in Barotes. So that's how you find Barotes. Follow the arc to Arcturus. And then it's just a quick hop to get to Corona Borealis. And um, if you want to place it between two bright stars, it actually appears between Vega, which is the super very bright star in, in Lyra, and Arcturus. Um, so if you find those two stars and you have a relatively dark sky, then you should be able to find this lovely um, pattern, which looks a bit like a crown. And it's not, none of the stars in this constellation are really, really bright. So you will struggle to find it if you are in a very light polluted area. But if you can get out to somewhere that's not too light polluted, then you should be able to find it. Uh, so it means the Northern Crown in Latin. And it's one of Ptolemy's original 48 constellations and one of the smallest. Um, and its stars are arranged in this beautiful arc shape, which has been depicted as various things in mythology. Um, so in Greek mythology, it represents the crown of Ariadne, the daughter of King Minos of Crete. Uh, and the princess Ariadne helped the hero Theseus defeat the Minotaur, which was a creature that is half human and half bull. And... Um, she helped him defeat the creature and find his way out of the labyrinth below the king's palace where the creature lived. Um, the Native American Shawnee tribe saw it as a group of dancing star maidens and the circle being incomplete because one of the maidens had fallen in love with a mortal warrior and returned to the earth to live with him. Middle Eastern civilizations saw the constellation as a broken dish and Australian Aboriginals saw it as a boomerang. Uh, the brightest star is known as Gemma, um, or uh, after a gem, or um, Alfeca, meaning the bright one of the dish in Arabic. Uh, and Alfeca is an eclipsing binary system. Uh, so it's got a small sun-like star that passes in front of a brighter star every 17 days as we see it from Earth. Corona Borealis doesn't have much in the way of deep sky objects that you can spot with a small telescope. However, it does have a visitor close by this month in the form of the asteroid Pallas. And Pallas is 
the third largest asteroid in the solar system after Ceres and Vesta. And it's the, it was the second one to be discovered um, in 1802 and uh, by Heinrich Olbers. And uh, Charles Messier, who uh, famously created the Messier ca catalogue of deep sky objects, actually noted it 23 years earlier, but mistook it for a star. And that's very easily done because it doesn't look any different to a faint star, even with a telescope. Um, and the way to know that it isn't a star is to watch it over the course of a few nights. And you can do that by photographing it or just you could um, go out and sketch the area and then um, look for movement. So if we, if we watch it over the course of a few nights, we can see that it's moving um, against the background stars and that movement against background stars tells us that it isn't actually a star, that it's something more local to us and is in fact an asteroid. It has a magnitude of about 9.5. Um, it's not too far past opposition at the moment, but it's still very faint, um, fainter than naked eye visibility. So you, you won't spot it with the naked eye and it, it will be difficult with binoculars as well. You'd be better off with a telescope if you have one. Um, so see if you can... If you have a, a small telescope, see if you can find Pallas and uh, convince yourself that it is an asteroid because it is moving against the background stars over the course um, of a few nights. Let's finish by taking a look at the ISS. Um, there's quite a few opportunities to spot the ISS going over this month. Um, so as always, you can use the Spot the Station website to find one that's suitable for you. Uh, the one that I would like to show you is on the 6th of July, um, starting at around 1.57 in the morning. And I've chosen this one because it should be quite bright and the sky should be relatively dark, um, so it should be fairly easy to spot. So here we go, rising in the west, and you can watch it make its way across the night sky over the course of five or six minutes to set again in the east. Um, and you'll know that it's the ISS because you'll be able to see that it's moving and it's really, really bright as well. That brings me to the end of our night sky tour for July 2024, and I wish you clear skies for all of your observing this month.